Welcome to the Boxing Lockdown, powered by SA Boxing Talk. We have the two gentlemen in the Zoom house, Hayden and Cyril, and we have the world-class boxing trainer, Anna Booth, joining us from the UK. Adam, it was October 2014 where I was walking aimlessly with a group of guys in Monte Carlo, and I happened to bump into you, and I said, are you Adam Booth? And you said to me, yes, and we struck up a friendship. And we also have the honor and the privilege, I'm not sure if you're going to agree, that we share a very close friend in Trist, Trist Dixon, Welcome to the Boxing Lockdown. Thank you. Nice to be here. Adam, let me, let me get straight in and start. And you're a trainer, manager, promoter. You've done everything in boxing, but you're known in the game not to take any bullshit. And it's one of the things I respect about you as a trainer, that you know what you want from your fighter, you know what you want from a fight. But often things don't go according to the way you anticipate. And I want to talk about, because we're obviously going to talk about David Hay, and I, that might not be your defining fighter in your career, because I'm sure you're still going to have many world champions. But that fight when he lost to Vladimir, it was a fight that I actually thought he was going to win based on his style, based on the fact that he could move and he was very fluid. We know he had a broken toe. But how disappointed were you after that fight? As disappointed as I am with any loss. Um, and it was magnified by the by the, the scale of the event. Um, but I knew all along that the biggest challenge for David was the fact that he was a cruiserweight. Even though he'd won the WBA Heavyweight Championship, he was a cruiserweight. And Vlad was a very big, a very athletic, 17-stone, big heavyweight. And that night, Vlad boxed out of his skin. He, he used his legs really well. Any, any attack that David tried to mount, Vlad would nullify it with that little shift with his legs. But he kept that mental pressure on him the whole time because of that size and that reach. And when, when you know, a few things that David tried just couldn't work, it became a really difficult fight where he kind of had to, it's almost like he had to use himself as bait and offer himself for Vlad to attack just so that Vlad would be somewhere in range that he could reach him. Yes, the toe was a factor in it, but that doesn't take away from the fact that even if his toe had been healthy, I think the outcome of the fight would have been the same because I thought Vlad boxed out of his skin and that's probably the most alert and the most effective that I ever saw him in applying that size of bite on someone. Um, Adam, um, speaking of David Hay, there was a whole incident with Derek Chisora a few years ago. We, <laughs> yeah, things went happened. We ended up with a big gash on your head. Can you take us through that? Like, was it was it, was it was a plan behind it, or did it just spark up? No, we we were there because we had agreed terms with uh, Klitschko management for David to fight Vitaly. So we went there with a view to speaking to them the day after the fight. So he beat Shazor on points. We actually weren't going to go to the press conference. We'd watch the fight and we were planning to meet with them the next day. But we just, we're just sit, we sitting there and said, oh, let's go to the press conference. And that was it. So David was trying to focus his attention on uh, Vitaly and the management. And they just weren't interested in having a conversation, bearing in mind that we'd had the final draft of the contract for the fight. Next thing, I think Frank Warren probably nudged Derek, and then that happened. So David was focused on Vitaly. Derek decided very shrewdly, I might get a fight out of this. He aimed it at David, and then, and then it went off. Yeah, so I want to go over to another fighter completely, someone that you had spoken of highly, and he's your current boxer, um, Josh Kelly. You had spoken of him highly from amateur days, uh, working with him. And so far, it's still early days in his career, but you, when you had spoken about him initially, you said that he is the next best, best thing in boxing. Uh, do you still, would you still believe that? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. It's a journey. And of, of all the fighters that I've worked with that have become world champions, they're always periods early in their career where I test them and all of them have looked in different ways or different manners uncomfortable at those moments because they have to be tested early they have to be matched competitively 
and, and the sooner you can get to that, the kind of the more confidence it gives me in mapping that next phase that they go, okay, well, you can cope with that level. If you talk about Josh Kelly, for example, his 11th fight was Ray Robertson. I think it was his 10th fight. I think. His 10th, uh, okay, his 10th fight, yeah. Um, uh, David Hayes' 10th fight was against Carl Thompson, I think, for his 11th fight. Um, George Groves, his eighth fight, I think, was for the Commonwealth title. So, so I'm, I'm a firm believer that if, if you want them to get to the top, you have to set the challenge early. And his, and his, and his match with Ray Robinson was um, a much more competitive challenge than people on the outside were giving it credit. You've got to remember that Ray Robinson was the last person to beat Terence Crawford in Crawford's last fight in the amateurs. And he drew with Kavalauskas, who then became the mandatory challenger for Ter- Terence Crawford. And I, but hand on my heart, I thought Josh won the fight with Ray, was, Ray Robinson by two rounds. But because he was trying to spin too many plates and showboat, and he, and he didn't always stay focused on the competing element that he was putting on a show at the wrong time, a draw wasn't an unfair thing. But to, if you're drawing at that level in your 10th fight, the level that is the level of a mandatory challenger for Terence Crawford, because Robinson drew with Kavalauskas, I walked away from that, disappointed with how he performed, because I knew he could be better than that, but happy with the fact that, okay, well, we now have a marker after 10 pro fights at the age of 24 of where the, from, from the level he's at now to the top level is top 10, because he's already drawn at that level. So although I was, I was disappointed with the draw, and I was a little bit disappointed with his performance. My, my belief in where he can be when all the elements of his style come back together is probably more galvanized by that than anything else. Adam, what I want to talk to you about fighters who lose. And I'm one of the trainers that think fighters only develop sometimes after they lose. And I want to go back to the Hay Thompson fight where he wasn't supposed to lose and he did lose. And I think that did a U turn for both you and David. I think you guys both had to kind of collectively sit down and think, okay, we've lost, what now? How much did that loss improve both you and David at that point in your careers? Probably more than anything else. And I would confidently say more than anything, more than any one thing that had an influence on the, on the trajectory of David's career as a fighter, and certainly um, um, the biggest influence on my trajectory as a coach and the way that I would then go about things. And from that point, I made, I made a conscious decision that our friendship would be put aside so there would be less time spent together as friends because there was only a 12-year age gap. And I'm quite, I think I'm quite young at heart and he was sort of an older version of a 23-year-old or a 22-year-old. So although there was 12 physical years, there's maybe only six years between us culturally. So I made a conscious decision that the only time, pretty much, if, if we were sort of 10 weeks away from a fight, that the only time I'd interact with him would be to do with training. And uh, I dropped the friendship side of it because I realized that the lines were getting blurred and that I wasn't, I, I, and I, although he took full responsibility for what he did wrong in the lead up to that, I have to take responsibility because I obviously allowed it to happen knowing the whole time through preparation, that it wasn't right. I knew the whole time. And he wasn't injured and he wasn't ill. There was just this element of complacency that had set in. And I was kind of going along with it because he was winning. I've always been a firm believer that just because you win doesn't mean you're doing it right. And just because you lose doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. Um, And so for me, that was, that was, I think it was the harshest lesson for him and it was certainly the harshest lesson for me. And then um, I want to talk about uh, Ryan Burnett. Um, from a South African point of view, there was a time he was talking he was supposed to fight uh, Zolani Tete in the World Boxing Super Series, but unfortunately, injury set in. How do you think that fight would have gone? Um, <clears throat> it was the fight that I was really looking forward to because Ryan has always been good against Southpaws. Zolani was... Um, is deceptively sturdy 
for someone so tall and slim. And I remember, I remember like I, I would always watch interviews to hear about what fighters say about their life. And there's a family thing to do with Zelane. And I think it was to do with his mother that kind of gave me the impression that he, he wasn't just fighting because he wanted to. And he wasn't just fighting because of the desire of a champion, but that he was motivated by something much stronger than just desire. Um, so I always knew that that would be a really competitive fight, a really competitive fight. I also believe that it would be, it would be a fight that wouldn't have been a blood fest. It wouldn't have been a lot of give and take, that it would have been a, a bit of a sharp shooting, tricky fight because I watched Zolani of how, what he was like when people stepped to him and what it was like when he had to step to people. Because one thing about tall fighters with long arms is that they're used to having distance very comfortably because the other guys have to go to their distance to try and find their way in. So they always find range very easily. But Ryan's able to play with that out of distance, in distance, very, very well. So for me, it would have been, it would have been a, a question of styles of making Tete step to Ryan, of Ryan being the counterpuncher, being the smaller man counterpuncher on the back foot. That's how I sort of started to plan that fight to happen, but it never did. But it would have been a, a monumental challenge for both of them. Let's stay with Ryan Burnett, actually, because the, the fight actually never happened uh, for Nonito Donaire when he had got, obviously got the victory over Ryan. Uh, he was in a fight Solani Tete as well. That also never ended up happening. Uh, what went wrong in that fight against Donaire? He got the injury. In technical, what happened was... Uh, um, his oblique muscle, so your oblique muscles around your waist. At the time, we thought it was his back because the obliques start from around the back. But the oblique muscles attach all around the edge of the pelvis mm -hmm. and it pulled away from the bone at a certain portion. Now, we didn't know that at the time because at the time, he's clutching his back. So I'm just trying to think, well, okay, well, let's get, it, get him back to the corner and just try and calm him down. And then said to him in the next round, just give nothing away and let's see if this settles down. Don't panic. But the very first time he tried, tried to throw a punch, he hit the floor again. So at the time, we thought it was something quite serious with his back. Turned out that his oblique muscles had pulled away from the bone in the pelvis. Um, freak injury. And it actually happened. Like, that the moment it happens, Ryan goes to throw a right hand. As he does, Donaire throws a left hook to the body at the same time. The left hook lands on the front of the pelvis. So Ryan's rotating one way, Donaire's hook hits his pelvis back the other way, and it was that separation that caused the muscle to come off the bone. So you can say that, although it was slightly low, it wasn't a low blow, that Donaire's left hook combined with Ryan throwing his right hand is what tore the muscle off the bone. Adam, I want to talk to you about a fight that happened several years ago, and there was a lot of bad blood. Charles Groves and James DeGale. There was a lot of banter. There was a bad tanner as well. Jim McDonald was in the opposing corner. Now, often trainers have to have some sort of emotional connection to the fighter. Naturally, you had your connection to George, but was there any friction between you and Jim going into that fight? And, I mean, after the fight was settled, I don't think George and James were ever friends. Am I right in saying that? But what was your relationship like with Jim going into that fight? Um, well, I've known Jim for a long time. Uh, going into that fight, there were some things that happened that left a bad taste in my mouth that I had to really not react to at the time. But not reacting to it was burning me. And I guess it kind of showed out at the end of the fight. Um, and that was, you know, we've spoken since then and it's fine. But there was, you know, at the press conference, he threw this bet of £20,000 on me, which I accepted at the press conference. But something happened at the press conference once the press conference had ended when I had my daughter in my arms and I had to get my daughter away from me to my friend because something was happening. And that's something that I found really difficult not to, re not, not to react to, but I had to control myself because my whole thing was telling George, do not get emotional in this fight. The one thing you can't do is get emotional because he hadn't evolved enough to be an inside fighter at that stage. And James wanted to sort of lure him into his long arm flurries. 
if I'm telling George, do not get emotionally invested. And I've been saying it to him um, for, the, for the, all the weeks in the build-up to the fight. And, and we were falling out at times because he was getting emotional and losing his call. And I'm trying to make my point as a coach. You know, I, I walked out the gym. I stopped sparring sessions early because he kept getting emotional. And then I get to that press conference and something happened where I wanted to just react emotionally. I had to keep a lid on it. And so I carried, kind of carried that teeth-gritted frustration into the ring. It's funny, though, because after a win, it does evaporate very quickly. Um, I'm talking about George Groves. He fought um, Carl Froch at Wembley Stadium in front of 80,000 people. What is, it, what is it like, like that atmosphere, 80,000 people? I mean, that must be electrifying. I mean, that's huge. Yeah, it's different because like, if you're in an indoor arena where you've got the roof, and there's 20,000. The noise is more intense because everyone's closer to you and you're in a room. So the sound's bouncing off the ceiling and it's coming back around you. So I find the, 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 the noise levels in an indoor room of the 20,000 is louder than the 80,000 in the stadium. But there is a difference in sound in the stadium where obviously there was no roof. You can hear the weight of the noise coming from a long way away. So you do have this sense of size, that there's people that far away and you kind of hear the weight of the noise, plus the fact you've got the fresh air. It's different. Um, but I would say that the, the more intense atmospheres happen in the indoor arenas. The big crowds and the number of 80,000 in Wembley Stadium are, are really impressive statistically. And financially, but in terms of that hot atmosphere, you need it enclosed, you need it closed, and that's where in that squared circle you really feel it more. Now, you're really close to obviously Tris Dixon, and we had Tris Dixon on the show a couple of weeks ago as well. And I know and I watched your YouTube videos with you did together where you had kind of punched the big fight analysis. Going forward, you, you, you did one fight there. Um, how many more big fights do you actually want to talk about? I know obviously you can't be involved in any of, uh, you couldn't have any involvement in those fights because you, you, maybe you'd feel a bit biased, but you know, going forward, would you like to do more of those? Yeah, and also, but if I'm involved with the fighters, I can't be sitting with Tris watching it in my front room either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I've always had the utmost respect for Tris as a journalist and as a person. And we have, you know, unfortunately enough to call him my friend. So we, we the first thing we, <laughs> The first thing we talked about doing actually was boxing life stories. And, and he was committed to that time-wise and I wasn't. So I just ended up being the guest on the first one. Um, but I thought the, the way that he did that was really tasteful. Um, and, and Tris just has a way of asking the right questions in the right way. You kind of don't feel like you're being interviewed when you're talking to Tris. Even though he's a friend, that comes across with other people. You, you're having a, a, like a, you know, a technical in-depth conversation with a friend with a friend rather than feeling like you're fending off questions. And then he mentioned the big fight companion and it's definitely something I enjoyed doing it. What funny story though. I, got, I enjoyed doing it. So <laughs> I've got to tell you this. No, no, tell us, tell us the funny story. Come on. We want to know the funny story. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> be, so it, there, there was a whole, there was six people as part of the production in my TV room where we were watching it. And they were, they turned up with cameras and there, there were two cameras four lights, a sound guy, all, all in my TV room, right? That's, that's how it was planned. It was a proper production. So I said, right, I'm going to go to bed. I'll set my alarm for, I think I said, uh, what, the fight was at four-ish, wasn't it? So I said, I'll set my alarm for 3.30. And at the bottom of it, I just said, don't ring the doorbell. I'll just make sure the gate's open. Because when my, when my doorbell thing goes off in the house, it's really loud. No one sleeps for it. So I thought, I don't want to wake everyone up at 3.30 in the morning, especially the kids, right? So, so I've said that. But at the bottom of the text, I said, don't, don't ring the doorbell. I'll leave the gate open. I went to bed and I forgot to open the gate. And I set my alarm for 3.30. For so, I must be getting old. I set my alarm for 3.30 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I've woken up thinking... What, is it? what time is it? And I've looked at my, 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 my uh, phone and it was 
and I'm, I'm half asleep and I'm trying to make sense of what I'm looking at, thinking I'm, I'm sure I was supposed to be up at 3.30 and there were loads of missed calls and like 30 odd missed calls and texts. But my phone was on silent because I genuinely thought the alarm was going to wake me up, always does. And there was no one there. So I've just thought, oh man, they've come. I haven't, I haven't let them in. I told them not to ring the doorbell and they'd gone. So I lay back into bed, just consumed, consumed with guilt. And I thought, oh man, I, I, this is terrible. So I went in, and it started to get light. And I went downstairs and pressed the gate thing. And as it opened, they're standing outside the gate. And they was, the whole production team had been standing there, arguing amongst themselves whether or not they should ring the doorbell. Tris saying, he said, don't ring the doorbell. And, they, and bear in mind, like some, of these, some of these fellas from the production crew drew, drove for three hours to get to my house. So we didn't start doing it. The fight, luckily the fight didn't start till five in the morning. I'm sitting there like a zombie trying desperately to wake up, surrounded by all these people, cringing inside because I made them stand outside for God knows how long because I just slept through and I set the alarm. And, and they never crucified me for it. Either that or they just... Adam, if it's any consolation, I would have rung your doorbell. Um... <laughs> they were all <laughs> themselves. And they actually did that. Uh, I think they did... Um, tic-tac-toe to see if, if they should ring it or not and they didn't and let's talk about andy lee and um several weeks ago i was watching it yeah one of the, the old fights against john jackson here in south africa and i took a little screenshot sorry a small video and i sent it to you and your response to me was one some of the most satisfying moments in your boxing career was with andy had his first shot against uh Chavez jr he got stopped and then he fought for the vacant title against Matt Korobov, which he was losing. But in boxing, it's not where you start, it's where you end. Tell us about those experiences and those moments with Andy. Oh, Andy um, is just, he's a unique dude. He really is. He carries, he, he's, he doesn't just act classy, he is classy. But he has no other way of being other than a classy, considerate dude that's got time for everyone. He just had this burning desire to be a world champion. And when he first started working with me, uh, he'd already lost to Chavez. So we did a two-week trial. And during that period, I remember thinking, I don't know how I'm going to work with this dude because the way he moves isn't how I, how I coach. The way that he's so dependent on standing upright and not moving his head is my belief or philosophy and I just didn't know how to work with him and it didn't it didn't gel very very quickly technically and in the gym but he put his he did put his faith in me and the one thing we worked on was making him comfortable in the positions that he would always try and stay away from like as a cronk fighter it's about testing a man with your power in the first round if you're tall and high you stand up tall and you fight tall and you stay tall and you do not let them come anywhere near you and so we went through this long period of time where all Andy was allowed to do in sparring was let people get up inside so that emotionally he became comfortable and more comfortable and more adept at looking after himself where he didn't want to be with the belief that if he could be emotionally comfortable where he didn't want to be, he wouldn't use up anxious energy when he was boxing long where he wanted to be because he was kind of boxing terrified of the fella getting where he didn't want him. Does that make sense? So we Absolutely. So we, we just kept making him comfortable with the, un with the uncomfortable because his, his assets were going to play out naturally anyway. And, and that, really does play, that really does show out. Um, in the John Jackson fight, where Jackson was a heavy puncher and he, push, he pushes Andy through the ropes and he's loading up. But while he's loading up, if you watch, Andy's keeping a low position and firing a hook. Now, they weren't landing. They were just going past, but he was doing the things that we drilled that in that uncomfortable situation, that he'd stay low and hook off shots. He then jumps out to the side, and if you look, see the overhead camera, he, he, he twists his ankle. Because he twisted his ankle, John Jackson thought he could just step to him and throw his shot. And as he did, because of course Andy's head's totally clear, twisted his ankle, and as John Jackson walked in, it, it was a terrific yeah. highlight knockout. When we did the Matt Korobov fight, was always about keeping the fight close in the first half because he, Korobov was always going to start fast. But I'd seen that he faded technically quite badly. And, 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 and again, if that jump forward and jump back wasn't working for him, he kind of got a bit confused. But the, I, rem I remember specifically working in training. The one thing we said was, as soon, like, a, like a Roberto Durant thing, 
As soon as you get touched, drop low. Every single time you get touched on the chin, drop low. So because what a lot of fighters try and do, they get touched on the chin and they try and see what's coming next. And that's too late. Because if you get touched on the chin, by the time you see it, it's already there if there's a follow-up shot. So the one, if you watch, Andy goes up close, Korobov lands a left hand, and instinctively, Andy just ducks down. It wasn't very pretty, but it didn't have to be. He just ducks his head down. As he popped back up, he threw the right hook that then turned Korobov into... So it was really, really satisfying as a coach. Those two moments of a career of a dude that I absolutely adore as a friend because he's such a classy fella um, played out the way they did and ended up giving him not only career highlight stoppages but a WBO world title to go with it as well. And like I said, the type of dude that Andy is and the, and, and the fact that it was such a big challenge technically to work with him with the friendship just made everything so satisfying. And then going back to David Hay, where would you rate him amongst the greatest cruiserweights of all time? Like, where would you place him? Um, as a cruiserweight, I'd match him with any cruiserweight in the ring. You'd probably put Holyfield above him. You'd have to. But aside from Evander Holyfield, there's only two cruiserweights who won the World Heavyweight title. And that's Evander Holyfield and David Hay. And on top of that, when he beat Valuev, it was the biggest weight disparity of any world title fight ever. So, and if you look at how he beat Jean-Marc Mormet in Paris, and Mormet was Ring Magazine number one, had beaten everyone that he fought, and then unified immediately against Enzo Macronelli. Although that world, le world level career was very short, with those two fights, it was very significant in those two fights. And if you then look at what he did uh, against Valuev, I think you'd, I would rate him second under Evander Holyfield. Maybe wow. I'm being biased. Okay, well, um, Adam, we know that like every trainer, like yourself, like Colin, you know, you're, you're the, the trainer, but you also have assistant trainers as well that sort of help you out. Um, just to bring a bit of light to that, who are your assistant trainers and, you know, how, um, you know can you just give us a bit of information about them? So I have two assistants, uh, Charlie Beat and Huzefa Iqbal, H, William H. So Charlie and H are two assistants. And I've had a number of assistants over the years. But Charlie and H have been my assistants for quite a few years now. And there's a great dynamic um, in, in terms of like, I'm a bit older now. Um, so it's almost like I step back a little bit energetically. I've worked with them a lot on the specifics that I want each of them to, to be good at, rather than them doing the same thing. Um, and then I, so when I do my work, whether it's with, mitts or whether it's talking or sparring of it i can focus purely on improving the things that we're working on technically and then the energy stuff i leave to the to the boys and it means that uh, i think it might extend my coaching career a little bit longer and um, what is the proudest moment as a boxing trainer in your career one that stands out i know there's a few and there's several but the one one that you sit back and you think, wow, I did that. Well, I did a, a, fighter. I did a, 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 a BT Sport review show with David last week. And we were, yeah, we were reviewing three of his big fights, uh, Mormek, Macronelli, and Chisora. And watching the Mormek fight and remembering everything that went before that, it was the first one in Paris on a Don King promotion where they were doing everything to unsettle us in a very hostile environment as well, in that, in that Marcel Sedan arena. Um, that has to be, if I had to pick one, it would be that one. Um, looking forward, you mentioned, you talked about Josh Kelly, um, but do you have any other fighters who you look at, young fighters who you think, this guy can go all the way, like any of the other... <laughs> Fighters in they will My fight or any fighters in general? Your, your fighters. Michael Conlon, um, the featherweight who's now ranked in the top 10. Michael was number one in the world as an amateur. Um, and over the last eight months, 
six to eight months, the things that we've been working on are starting to show themselves naturally without thought. And so I'm really excited now. He, the, his preparation for the fight that got cancelled in New York just recently um, was the best we've had yet. The way he was sparring, the things he was doing. Like I said, like, you, you know what it's like. Colin, you, you work on things, but it takes time. It takes time. And it, it's almost like being an amateur. He, he, was a, he was world number one as an amateur with 250 amateur fights behind him and a long amateur career. And that is harder to change than someone that might have only had 30 amateur fights and just boxed at national level because they're closer to being a blank piece of paper. Whereas Michael's proven skill set to get him as number one in amateur became really gout, really deeply ingrained in him. So the little things with Michael were similar to the things that I've worked on with Andy. Some of them were. Um, took over a year to start falling into place. And I was, I, I'm gutted that that fight fell through because I think, in, I think if, if I'm looking at Andy, uh, sorry, um, Michael Conlon and Josh Kelly, and you say to me, who's going to fight for a world title first? I'd say Michael Conlon. Okay, well, Adam, I want to quickly go away from boxing for a quick second. Um, if if I if I read this correctly, and I don't know if I have, uh, you were you were once a health consultant for Kali Mano. Is that true? Uh, yes. How did that come about? Uh, <laughs> well, I was so I was um, working out of a gym in central London called the Third Space, which is in Piccadilly. It's, you couldn't get more central London than this, this facility. And it was an incredible facility, way ahead of its time. And they headhunted me to set up the actual training. So to recruit all the, the, the so we had like 30 coaches or 30 personal trainers there. Because I used to teach anatomy and physiology and strength and conditioning. But I was, while I was being a boxing coach, because I had to make a living. So I did that and I said, like, I'll, do, I'll do this job, but I want the boxing area to myself, I don't want other pros coming in. I don't want it stained with other philosophies. And you know what this pro game is like, right? So, so, I, so I, I did. And then my thing was that I, I never trained members. I only trained my fighters and I trained the staff. One day this dude turns up and uh, he's like, I'm here to train with you. And I said, no, you must make a mistake. But someone in reception had made a mistake and booked him in to see me for, for a training session. And like you could see, he never boxed in his life. And, but I must have been in a really good mood. I felt sorry for him, so I started training him. And I, and I deliberately made him vomit <laughs> so that he wouldn't come back. <laughs> <laughs> he went. Dude turns up again two days later, having booked him with me again. So by this point, I'm getting irritated with reception because they weren't supposed to book him in with me. But then the way he presented himself, I, I felt really sorry for him. Because he said, you know, I've, he said to me, you know, I've never felt like a man before. And the other day you made me feel manly. And, I, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a softy at heart. And I felt for him. So I gave him his second session. Notwithstanding, I gave him his second vomiting session as well. Just to, <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyway, his name, was, uh, his name was William Baker. And he was the uh, creative director for Kylie Minogue. And um, he phoned me a few days later and he said, uh, you know, I haven't told you this, but I work with so and so, and she really needs somebody who will tell her what she needs to do because she was surrounded by a whole load of people that didn't want the same thing to upset her. And he th and he and her were very close. And he thought I was the man with that type of attitude to be able to say, right, go to bed at this time, eat this food, do that, do this, and that's how it started. I mean, making him vomit twice. I was only doing it to stop coming back. <laughs> Adam, you, you love boxing, but you hate the business side of it. Uh, quotes that you told to us several months ago. When you were growing up watching boxing, who was the one trainer you looked up to and admired? And why? Honestly? Yeah. I, hand on heart, I never watched. When I, when I boxed, very quickly, I stopped listening to them because I'd go home and we had, uh, back in those days, we had, um, if you were lucky, you had a VHS video recorder and the remote controller had a cable coming out of it, right? 
and when you when you used to rewind things, you'd see it going backwards on the screen and you play again. I would get I had VHS of Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran, and Wilfred Benitez. They were the first three I just used to saturate myself with. And but it was, I was twelve or thirteen years old. But what I was watching every day, I'd then go to the gym and what they were telling me that I'm like, you, you're saying that, but that's not what I'm watching. And they're the best, they're the best ever. And that don't, and so very early on, I became a bit of a little smart ass prick and I stopped listening to coaches <laughs> because they say the opposite of what I was watching these guys do. Then I went on to people like Hector Camacho. And so that only galvanized this arrogant, I'm not listening to you because, you know, it, so, so, and that just, that's just always played through um, to the point where I ended up with my own coaching philosophy and it was like, well, if I'm, if I'm going to succeed, it's going to be on my turn. If I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail because I make my mistakes, not someone else's mistakes. And so that then became the sort of adult way of explaining to myself why I would be this way. Whereas as a kid, I just wanted to have my left hand low, be all flash and stylish like these dudes that I idolised and not listen to these amateur coaches who only ever wanted me to box like that. Um, speaking of coaching, um, Brit um, in the past, like British trainers wouldn't mention talked about as much as they are now. Like you and so a few others nowadays, they, there's a lot of talk around about them. What do you think? What do you think that's the reason for that? Um, why people don't talk about British trainers as why people didn't talk about British trainers back in the days like they do now? What, what's the difference? What has changed? Well, I think um, there's a lot more world champions coming out of Britain now. Um, when you have, when you have, so the business is creating opportunities because of the investment from Sky Sports and, and, and really single-handedly over the last dec the decade, Sky Sports have kept boxing a viable business because without their constant investment in the sport, there'd be no TV, there'd be less money, which means you can buy less title fights and buy less challenges. Do you understand? So there was a, a successful amateur period with Aldi Harrison, David Hay and Carl Froch that then became the international sort of improvement of amateur level where you had Olympic champions and world silver medalists and stuff like that. Um, and then Sky's investment and what I believe is, is, is the overall level of the fighters' abilities of breaking out of that limited mindset I was just telling you about, about not just being like that in the amateurs, but actually fighting in a much freer style. A much, you know, there's a, there's a, if you look at the style of fighters that come out of Britain now, and you look at the style of fighters that came out of Britain in the 70s, apart from a couple of, a couple, a couple of rare examples like Kirkland Lang, there was a very British style, just like there was a very German style. But that doesn't cut, that doesn't exist anymore. There's much more of a rev styles and confidence and belief in the fighters. Because back in the day, it was like, well, the American fighters are the best. The Cuban fighters are the best amateurs and the American fighters are the best pros. But it's not like that anymore. There's, there was that shift when it's like, oh, actually, no, we got a lot of success fighters. And, and success breeds confidence that breeds success. So the champions give the younger ones that belief that here's someone that's like me, near me, that can be a champion, and then they become champions that then feeds the next generation. So I think generationally, generationally, I don't think I've ever said that word before, um, there's been a, an evolution of the level of fighters. And so, you know, how good you are as a coach, if you don't have a fighter that shows you publicly with their success, no one will ever really know about you, and no one will ever talk about you. Some of, the, some of the most impressive coaches I've come across, nobody knows because they're in the amateurs. But the way they coach and the way they teach and the things they say now are really impressive. Um, so you're hearing about the coaches now because of the momentum of success of British professional boxing that comes from the amateur success, the changing of the way that British fighters fight and the continued investment of Sky Sports because there was no other broadcaster for a long period of time that was investing money in the sport. Without investment, you don't get the opportunity. 
I want to talk about, obviously, you, you got a great stable of fighters and you've produced a really good champions. When a guy comes to you now from the amateurs and you have to start from scratch, I mean, do you still enjoy that process or, you know, would you, would you only accept the guy sort of if he's got like an Olympic background or a world amateur medal or something like that? I mean, how does it, how does it work with you? So, um, okay. So if, if I'm going to work, I don't want to make myself sound like a bit of a prima donna, but now if, 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 if someone wants to work with me, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't want to work with loads of fighters. And I want to work with good fighters that I think that have proven themselves in the amateurs. And you can see the, 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 the okay, well, there's already questions that have been answered about your level because international amateur grade is grade. And it's then about converting that grade into the pros. That's the first thing. Secondly, I've got to like them as people and I've got to, tr I've got to trust my perceptions about their character. Um, and... It's funny, actually, you, you said, because I keep telling myself, I've, I've almost had enough of this, can't keep doing this. Like, because it doesn't matter whether it's a, a novice pro or a world champion, you're always trying to improve their jab. You're always trying to improve their left hook and the way they set it up and the way they land it and the way they exit after it. The basics, are, is, this is a sport of basics that doesn't look very interesting on Instagram when you look at someone doing pads. Because if you're truly coaching... It's boring to watch from the outside unless you can hear the things that are being said. It's this epidemic of flashy pad work. That just make, that's just fun to watch and good, makes the pad man look good. So uh, there's, this, there's this amateur now girl called Ellie Scottney who I manage. Um, and she's got a really, uh, an excellent young coach called Sam Mullins. Um, and Ellie comes and has started to come to me once a week just because she wants to do a bit of technique with me. So she came last week because we can start in the gym again. And, and the thought of, I was driving to her, I thought, I thought of going, oh, okay, so I've got to look at the jab. I've got to see the right hand. I've got to look at the basics, see the basics. Don't care that she was number one as an amateur or, you know, really good amateur. I've got to look at the basics. And before I knew it, two hours have gone by. And we're working on the jab. So there's got to be an inherent love that I tell myself I don't have. But when you put me in there, it becomes timeless. So maybe I, maybe I do still enjoy it. But if you'd asked me that two weeks ago, I would have probably given you a different answer. And um, let's talk about the lowest points of your career. What, what moment was it and why? Hey, losing to Carl Thompson. I mean, I was... When David turned pro, none of the big promoters were able to sign him. He was, world, like, he was world silver medalist as an amateur. And that was because um, I, had a, I, had a friendship, I had a friendship with somebody called Ben Anderson, who's an investigative journalist who makes documentaries for Vice and HBO and he's an award-winning investigative journalist now. But he worked for the BBC at the time and he was, he, he was responsible for taking Audley Harrison directly to the BBC or was involved in that. And because David and I were friends with Ben, Ben was able to introduce us directly to BBC, which meant that he was a novice pro, turning pro, with a novice pro coach stroke, not yet a manager, going straight to the broadcaster, not just the broadcaster, but the BBC. So we cut out that, that process, that direct contract with the BBC, where the BBC were paying David the money directly, and we then chose the promoter whose shows we went on, and in return for that, the BBC would give the promoter the undercard and the exposure. So all of a sudden, whereas the promoter has the broadcast deal and has the power, it was us that had that power because Audrey Harrison had kicked that door down as Olympic gold medalist. So imagine the, imagine the hatred and the acidic attitude towards David and me. And more so me, because they didn't want me, they wanted David. And when he lost against Carl Thompson, the, that was their opportunity to have at me, and they did. And I'm seeing my name in the national papers and on TV, just being ripped to pieces as being the reason why he failed. Not, they'd always said all along, I didn't know what I was doing. And, and now it was time for David to get rid of him and actually take your career seriously and go to someone that knows what they're doing. And, that, and I felt that very personally. 
So that for me, that was the lowest point. Um, and then we often ask this on the show uh, because we have this quite often in boxing. But how many have you ever had any fighters that you thought that this guy can go all the way, and then they just didn't make it because of reasons that are beyond boxing? Something how they behave, how they act on the outside, or something like that. Absolutely, it's the cracks of life, which is a, a phrase that Andy Lee has passed on to me from Emmanuel Stewart, and it is probably the only. It's the only phrase that I can remember ever using that I've taken from somebody else and tried to pass off as my own. But a man, it's the cracks of life, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. That having the ability and the opportunity is a small part of it. You've got, you've got to have the ability and the opportunity and the resilience and the de desire and determination to go through what you go through, but also you got to avoid the other cracks of life that aren't sport related or aren't in your control. The influence of your friends or family or your partner, illness, injury, life, finance, circumstances. There's so many things that play in. It's not just about being good enough. And probably there's one fighter that uh, I've worked with that really showed that. And that was a guy, a featherweight called Mitchell Smith. Um, just a natural fighter with a natural, with natural power and with all the ingredients, tough, clever, great timing, great power, just that understanding of where he's at with really good fighters, bigger fighters in, 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 in the ring. And, uh, and, and his life went off the rails and he ended up going in prison, came out of prison, but his personal life and everything and he put on a lot of weight and he's, he's been losing his weight, but he's still got a long way to go the one thing that the one thing he's got going in his favor is that i think he's still only 26 but and, and in the amateurs right you you see you always see kids that are great talents but just have a cranky attitude towards life there's so many elements you know that there's so many elements it's not just about ability and opportunity and it's almost like as a coach probably our biggest challenge is help guiding them through the cracks of life. So that when these wobbles happen, you become the one that they sit and talk to because you've seen it before and you've had these conversations before, but you sit and talk to them and just let them know that it's just a moment in time. That's all it is, it's just a moment in time, it will pass. It might take a few months, but it will pass. So don't lose your way in your own mind while you're going through this little storm. It's just a crack of life. And I will quote Emmanuel Stewart. Uh, Adam, uh, when it comes to a 50-50 fight, uh, when, you, when you know you're up against it, you know it's going to be a really, really close fight, what for you makes the biggest difference? Obviously, you're coming up against, perhaps if it's a 50-50 fight, another good trainer in the corner. And I know that you're really good with corner instructions, uh, particularly in the, in the crucial moments. Uh, what for you makes it, what, what gives you sort of, what makes you feel that you have the edge over your opponent uh, in the other corner? I don't, I, don't, I don't think about it like that. It, it's, really, it's a boxing match. That's all it is. I remember um, the, probably the most nervous I felt was when Hay, when Hay fought Macronelli. Not because I wasn't confident about the fight, but we were staying in a hotel. And as we walked out the room, we were looking over at the O2. And it was like this, the night sky. And all of a sudden, you just got an, you got a, an impression of the size of the event. And I always tell myself this one thing, always, always, at any moment, whether I'm, whether I'm thinking about the magnitude of the fight, the difficulty of the fight, the style of opponent, whoever is in their corner, whether they're a donking fight, it, I just remind myself of one thing, it's just a boxing match. That's all it is, it's just a boxing match. So, and it happens a lot less now, but whenever an event or abstract thoughts would start to play out in me, my one solace was to go away from everyone else. Don't let anyone else get in my headspace and just say, it's just a damn boxing match. That's all it is. Okay. He jabs like that. He throws his right hand like that. That's, he's got good power on his left foot. You don't want to, and then you start thinking about it technically and all the nerves and apprehensions just disappear. I don't think about, I don't think about, 
I always tell my fighters, don't go into a fight with confidence based on the other fighter's weakness. Because that's a sign of weakness. Go into a fight with confidence, looking at the opponent's strengths, knowing that you can deal with them and disarm them. And so, and, and so, so, and so I don't think about the other corner. I just look at the job in hand and we prepare for it. And we, the first thing we do is pay respect to the strengths of the other person. Don't look for the weaknesses. The weaknesses will expose themselves. First thing, art, uh, the art of war. Make yourself unbeatable. And you do that by disarming the things that he's good at. And that, that everything else evaporates. It's just a boxing match with a load of paraphernalia around it. Adam, it's been absolutely magic having you on the show. Um, your last parting shot for the boxing lockdown. Say that again. Sorry, that it froze then. Your, your, your last parting shot for the show on the boxing lockdown. I really enjoyed it. I don't, don't, I don't enjoy doing things like this, but I always feel like when I, when I talk to Tris, I feel like it's me talking to him. When I, when I watch or listen to myself talking, about, talking to Tris, I always sort of go, oh, okay, yeah, that, that feels, like, feels like I'm watching me. That's what it feels like on the inside. And that's what this one felt like. So I appreciate it and, and thank you for that. That's great. One of the best boxing trainers in the world, Adam Booth, joins us here on the Boxing Lockdown, powered by SA Boxing Talk. It's been a great show. We will catch you again soon. Yeah.